So now I'm shot in my left hand, I'm shot in my right arm, I'm shot in the chest. And I said, I got to fight my way out of here. I didn't have my weapon. So if I could get to my, because I had dropped it when I got shot. If I get to my weapon, I got a chance. I got to my weapon, I started fighting. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was uh, born in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, raised there until I joined the military. To me personally, I can only see that I was headed down the wrong path. And I knew that the military was a way out. And we had heard that the National Guard was recruiting minorities. So we volunteered, my brother and I, and, uh, because we didn't have any work. Uh, so that was uh, something to get us started. When I was in the National Guard, I kind of enjoyed it. And I asked, could I join the uh, regular military? And they said, of course. Uh, I had attained the rank of private first class, but they say you'll go back to private E2. I said, okay, fine, I'll take that. And so I joined the uh, active army and was sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for basic training. And then they sent me to artillery training at Fort Seal, Oklahoma. And while there, I heard that they were taking volunteers for airborne school. And uh, I had an uncle that was a paratrooper, so I knew about it. And I always wanted to emulate him in some kind of sense. So uh, I volunteered and I passed the physical and went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for airborne training. And that was in January 1961. And then on October 12, 1961, John F. Kennedy awarded us the Green Beret, officially. And I was in that group. And so I always considered myself as being one of the ones to actually receive the Green Beret legally, October 12, 1961. First years of the Vietnam War, I, I didn't remain stateside. I went to Dominican Republic to quell an uprising with the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, my brother went to Vietnam in 65, and I went to Dominican Republic in 65. Uh, when they, uh, we took care of a little uprising in the Dominican Republic, I still wasn't uh, picked to go to Vietnam. So I volunteered to go. And eventually I got there, and that was 1969. I was with the 5th Special Forces Group in Vietnam. My unit was signed in, in the Delta, what we call it in Vietnam. That's in the 4th Corps Zone. I was in the Mike Force. The Mike Force is a unit that was designed to either go out and help other units when, when things went south, or uh, either them when they own operation and missions, they were to uh, search and destroy. These young men were strictly fighters, and that's what we did. And I had been on numerous operations prior to September 69, but I was still in the Four Corps. And we had an assignment to go near the Cambodian border because we had a lot of problems with the North Vietnamese coming in the South Vietnam from Cambodia. And it was sort of like a blocking mission. I had never been under that much fire. Uh, when, when I took my company and I moved forward, we didn't expect that much fire, and it was very heavy, very. Once uh, moving into the area where my team saw it, well, the other company was at. I had my own company. And once we moved forward, and I got a call that said my team saw it had been killed. And my team captain said he had been shot several times. I think it was four. And he was shot in the mouth, in the chest, and the arm quite a bit. And I told him I would get to them, but he's got to get medevac out. And I moved my company out. And I got to the exact spot to where he had been killed at. 
And when I got to that, that point, uh, I mean, the fire was so heavy, I don't even understand why we didn't lose a lot of men at that point. So we started to counterattack, and we fought back hard. Uh, I had to go in there and get my team starting sar body out. I went in the first time with two men, found out where the body was at, got to the body, rolled him over. I gave him last rites because I was born a Catholic. Uh, and when I did that, they opened up, and two men with me got wounded. I took them out. We couldn't get the body out, so I had to go back again. I got more volunteers, and I went in with hand grenades. I'm, I'm running on automatic. Uh, get to the body, get the body out, and uh, the mission will be accomplished. And that was it. We got to his body. Uh, uh, once with me, got his body, dragged him out. And when he dragged him out, uh, he dropped his, his pad, come out of his, his pants pocket, uh, which is a sensitive material was in his, in his pack. I had to go back and get it. And at that point, I went back to get it, and I was uh, shot three times. Uh, but when I went, before I went in to get that uh, map case, I got two bags of hand grenades. I went in, I tossed them in every bunker that I could find. Uh, at close range, I didn't worry about getting hit by my own hand grenades. Uh, I just had to take care of the problem. I, I don't know the count of how many bunkers I threw grenades in, but I was able, my interpreter was able to get the map case. Once my interpreter got the map case, uh, when he picked it up, uh, NVA standing in front of me, in front of me, between him and me, shot me in the chest. And I went down with the interpreter left with the map case. Now I'm in there by myself, so I got um, the, the NVA was taken out, of course, but I had to get to a, uh, some cover, so I got behind a tree. And they were literally trying to shoot the tree down. And I'm by myself, and I don't, don't really know what to do. But I say, you either fight or you die. I didn't realize that I had been shot in the arm when they were trying to shoot the tree down. Uh, I had already tried, fixed my chest. So I was shot in my chest, I was shot in the arm, and I had one other hand grenade, I threw it and I got shot in the hand. So now I'm shot in my left hand, I'm shot in my right arm, I'm shot in the chest. And I said, I got to fight my way out of here. I didn't have my weapon. So if I could get to my, because I had dropped it when I got shot. If I get to my weapon, I got a chance. I got to my weapon, I started fighting and fighting, and I called in the Air Force to drop a bomb, but they said it was too close. They couldn't do it, it would take me out. And a light helicopter came in. They said, we don't have any heavy weapons, but we can drop explosives. That'll give you a chance to get out. I said, drop them. Uh, they dropped the explosive. I fired up all the ammunition I had, and I said, you gotta run. But what happened, the reason why I had to run, I had told my company to leave me if I go down. So they were gone. And I'm there by myself. So what I had to do was to run to catch up with them. And I'm shot three times. And I don't know how far I ran, maybe a quarter mile, maybe half a mile with three bullet holes. Maybe been longer than that, I don't know. Can't remember that well. But I got to them and got medevac. Uh, when I got out, it's kind of comical. When I got out and everybody was medevaced out, including me, I uh, was on the helicopter and the pilot said, well, he's got to stop at another hill to pick up some more wounded and be killed in action, right? And I said, what? And I looked down and I saw them fighting, you know, when we were getting ready to land. And I say, I just got out of mess and you landing to pick up some people. <laughs> I was a little upset. I was a little upset, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. But he picked up the wounded and then uh, 
cup of KIA and we took off. The next year you received the Distinguished Service Cross. You also returned to Vietnam for a second tour. What unit were you with then and what can you tell us about that tour? Uh, went back to the same unit, uh, went back to my same company and went back to the same area fighting again. Uh, but I was, was told I had to go to Command and Control North, which was a Mag V SOG. It was a classified uh, unit. And uh, scary to, to go there. But I said, you got to man up and do what you got to do. So I spent nine months in that unit. Uh, I was decorated in that unit. I can't tell you much more about it because it was a classified unit. But I saw action in that unit. What was life like after leaving the service? Very difficult. I didn't have an umbrella. You know, you can have PTSD in the military, but you got an umbrella over you. That's the military. Uh, after the military, you don't have the same friends. Hard to make new friends in civilian life at the same level that you used to. It was very, very difficult. Yeah, I worked from job to job, job to job, because attitude, temperament, anger, you know, it was just hard to manage until, you know, I got a lot of help from the Vet Veterans Administration, doctors and whatever. But, you know, I told myself, you got to get this in check. You know, I, I didn't want to be in that denial. I was in denial for a long time, just had to come out of it. And once I came out of it, uh, and was able to talk about some of the things that I did in combat, it really helped because you got that in your gut and you need to get it out. And I had to get it out. Uh, the uh, nightmares, the sweats, the anger trips, emotions, all that come with PTSD. And it, it's, it's tough. Did you know you were under consideration, or did you only find out when you were chosen to receive the Medal of Honor? I had, had no clue, no information from anyone or nothing. And really what happened is that she got a phone call from Washington, D.C. And she said, does Colonel Davis want to speak to you at the Pentagon, and he wants you standing by the phone. And the next day at 12 o'clock, and I said, okay, but I wonder what he wants. Evan and I, I'm in trouble. It's the men in black looking for me. I done said something or done something. She said, no, that's the answer. She couldn't convince me of what. So I'm standing by the phone the next day. And my mind went crazy that night because I said, did you talk too much or did you do something you shouldn't have done? Cause what, what do they want me for, you know? You're on your way to jail, that's what I would tell myself. So I'm about to phone the next day, and it's Colonel Davis say, um, well, this uh, uh, very important uh, person needs to speak to you. And I couldn't think about who that was at all. Very important dignitary. And got on the phone and said, this is President Obama, and I want to inform you that you're going to be awarded the uh, Medal of Honor. And I almost fell out because I didn't have no clue of this was happening. This has come out of, out of nowhere. And I still couldn't believe it. And so I told, I, I told my wife, I don't believe that. People pulling cranks. So I'm, I'm going to find a number. And I found a number and was able to get the call through and call Colonel Davis and say, I was just checking because I thought it was a prank. He chewed me out. Say, don't you ever question nobody when you get a call from the Pentagon, right? That uh, I knew right then it was true, because he was he was highly upset at me. Yeah. If you're enjoying this video, you should join our exclusive Patreon community to receive early access to videos each week, the chance to send questions to our heroes, and much more. We scour the country to identify, film, share, and preserve these first-hand battlefield accounts. And time is of the essence. To join our mission, visit patreon.com slash American Veterans Center or click the link in our description. It's up to each of us to guard their legacy and honor their sacrifice. Thanks, and now back to the interview. 
You know, it, you, you're in awe for a while, you know, disbelief, and then the next thing you become very proud. But the point is, he told me, say, well, you can't tell anybody about this. You got to keep this confidential. And so I couldn't express my feelings for 10 months. I couldn't tell anyone. And so, but if I were told someone, they would say I'm crazy anyhow. So, <laughs> but you know, it's a proud moment when you are recognized. Well, you know, going to the White House, I had never really been. And yes, everything is scary, and I'm always scared of men in black, right? And then all the security checks you got to go through, this and that, and, and I'm not going to make it through, and this and that. And, and actually, they did have trouble with my ID card, right? So I couldn't go in to receive the Medal of Honor. I say, boy, but they finally correct that. And uh, just to be in the building is, is something else, but to be with the president is, is awesome. And I was able to go into his office and talk to him. And uh, what a person. What does the Medal of Honor mean to you? You know, that's a question that I've always uh, had trouble with. It, what it means that I'm getting recognized for something I did, but I call it just doing my duty. But then again, it gives me a tool to go out and lecture people and talk to people about the sacrifices that the men and women had made for this country and try to educate the younger children about what the military really is about, is keeping our freedoms. So it means a lot to me. And so I stay busy uh, because education is the key. What are you most proud of in your service to this country? I'm proud of mostly being, becoming an airborne paratrooper, then a Green Beret, and yeah, combat soldier and survive this. And so it's something I hold my head up high with because I know the sacrifices men made because I've seen it. And so what it means to me, I can go out and honor them when I talk to people because the Medal of Honor, it represents all those before me. And there are probably many that should have the Medal of Honor but just never looked at it. Just, just like in my case. You know, I want people to remember that these sacrifices are, are for the freedoms. The men and women that serve overseas in combat, they have families, but they are put their life at risk so that you'll have a good life to protect your family. And, you know, it's, it's, when we lose a soldier, we lose a lot, especially on the battlefield. And so we have to honor those that have given their lives. And so every chance I get, I reflect back on the ones I knew that lost their life. But they lost it given, not taken.